supplies with Dr. Beck, late winter management of cool season forages with uh, Brian Pugh, our Northeast Area Extension Agronomy Specialist, and finished with jump starting warm season forages with limited rainfall with Leland McDaniel. But I uh, get started back off, go right back to Dr. Beck, our Extension Livestock Specialist at OSU, uh, talking about feeding alternatives. And if you do have questions, uh, there's a couple options. We either in the chat room. Uh, if you want just the panelists to see it, just uh, ignore uh, anything else. But if you want everyone to see the question, make sure you use that drop down to change it from all panelists to all panelists and attendees. Uh, but we'll try our best as presenters to uh, read off those questions. If you do want to stay anonymous, just send it to the panelists. Thank you, Josh. So I wanted to start out but with this picture here, this is a picture of some drought stressed pastures that I was managing when I was on a research station in Southwest Arkansas. Um, this was taken in the middle of the summer. We're looking at a area just kind of south and east of, of Idabel, Oklahoma. And, you know, this is a 60 inch rainfall area and we'd only had about a total of 30 inches that that year, which, you know, in Oklahoma, we consider that to be a pretty good year. But I showed this uh, picture at a drought meeting that we had had during that uh, drought in, in 2011, 2012. And I had a producer look at that and say, well, you know, if I had that much grass, I wouldn't be at this meeting. And um, so, you know, we had decided to destock this pasture, move our cattle to a sacrifice area, some dry lot traps, um, so we don't do any repeated grazing and damage, more damage and de denuding of this pasture. So um, I'm saying this because, you know, what I'm talking about to stretch forage supplies is not exclusive from what uh, uh, Leland and, and Brian are going to present later about managing those pastures. Um, you know, and like I said, these you know, different areas, a drought, if we're, you know, managing pastures, uh, stocking for 60 inches of rain, you know, what, you know, we would consider a drought is, is different than if we're in, you know, the Oklahoma panhandle. And, and you know, so area to area, uh, we may see differences in what we consider a drought, but, you know, we can still have a lot of impact on these areas. So, you know, we're going from, you know, a situation where we, we may not worry about, you know, wasting some hay, you know, we're, we're going to put the hay out and put as much as we can, or we might move to an, a spot where we're, we've got an empty hay barn. Uh, and, and whenever we're, you know, in the middle of the summer and when we're trying to fill these hay barns, but we're, we're stock, stopped at about half capacity and then we're starting to feed out of it, that's when this gets to be an issue. And you know, we can do some different things as far as supplementation uh, or or just feeding cattle to get us through these situations. Um, when we're looking at drought survival, you need to have a drought management plan. Have your, your ranch designed so that you can handle seasonal droughts or, or even, you know, just real longer term dry periods because we know they're going to happen. And if you have a plan, then you can have an idea of, of what steps you need to take before it happens. You, you know you, you can start destocking pastures uh, or taking you know bigger steps. Um, and then we also you know need to look at stretching the forage resources um, you know in all the different ways and use those tools that we uh, know we have available. So when we're you know, out of hay, you know, we can try to buy hay from our neighbors, but they're all in the same shape. You can ship in hay from out of state. That's very expensive. And then you can do some other things, limit feed hay, time limiting hay, uh, uh, limit feeding hay, or find alternative feeds. And that's what I'm going to talk about using a higher supplementation rate to reduce hay intake or program feeding cows, uh, TMRs or total mixed diets to meet those requirements. One of the things that we would probably consider before we start feeding extra feed or using a TMR, you know, is early wean those calves. Get those that pressure off from the cow 
um, because calves at about three months of age start adding to the, the stocking rate of your, your pastures. A 400 pound calf at about, you know, you know, five or six months of age is it considered about half of a, a animal unit. So um, that's a considerable amount of, of forage consumption. Also, lactating cows have higher nutrient requirements and they eat a lot more than a dry cow. So when we're starting to talk about limiting hay feeding, you know, we, we need to look at a mid gestation uh, dry cow is a lot hard, easier to feed and easier to, to get feed delivery to that animal than a lactated cow. This is uh, some research that we conducted in Arkansas uh, at that Southwest station during a drought. We moved these uh, uh, three quarter Angus quarter uh, Brahmin cows in to the barn, individually fed them both a uh, processed hay, so we can determine hay intake, uh, and a, a fairly low quality, low energy uh, byproduct feed, uh, the old rice bran. And um, this was becoming available. They were starting to, to take all the oil out of the, the rice bran at that time, uh, taking quite a bit of the energy content out of that. So it'd be similar um, to slightly lower in energy that, than a, a soybean holes or wheat mitts that would, we would have available here. We looked at hay intake, nutrient intake from hay, and total tract digestibility from cows that were fed uh, supplements at zero, essentially half percent of body weight, three quarter percent of body weight, and close to one percent of body weight. And we either compared that to this deal of corn or D oil dry span bran or a brown corn type diet. Um, those cows ate about 23 pounds of hay when they were unsupplemented. Um, when we supplemented at about four, uh, about half percent of body weight, you know, that, that's about six pounds per cow for a, a 1200 pound cow. Uh, we decreased hay intake a little bit uh, for both the corn and the rice bran. When we got up to three quarter percent of body weight, we decreased uh, hay intake quite a bit more. Now, when we're looking at a byproduct feed, when we went to a higher supplementation rate, we had more substitution when we fed corn than when we fed rice bran. And the reason for that is we're, we're, the starch in that corn is changing the rumen environment quite a bit more um, you know, that rice bran not being extremely high in energy, but being a fiber-based byproduct feed really doesn't change the, the rumen environment as much. So uh, quite a bit lower substitution ratio at that higher supplementation rate uh, when we're comparing, you know, the corn to that byproduct feed. So what, you know, what can we expect from that? Um, uh, 1,100 pound non-lactating cow, lactating cow fed 0.67% of body weight. We're expecting about 19 pounds of dry matter total intake, seven pounds of, of uh, feed dry matter intake. Uh, that's about eight pounds of feed per day. And that will reduce forage intake by about one third. So we're, you know, decreasing the hay supply needed you know, if 100% of the hay we're feeding goes to uh, intake by the cow on a 30 cow herd, that's about uh, uh, 7,200 pounds of, of uh, supplement per month, um, a 48,000 pound or, or 12 ton, 24 ton uh, truckload would last us close to seven months. So, you know, for a 30 cow herd, that's quite a long time to uh, store a lot of these higher starch, higher fat feeds, you know, and, and you know, that's gonna take up a lot of room in a barn. So you need to lose, use something like soybean holes, corn gluten feed, or a defatted rice bran, knowing we're not getting a one-to-one -one, uh, substitution rate with that supplement. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is, um, uh, probably a, a more complex um, 
because we're um, delivering all the feed to the cow in a total mixed diet, um, if we can limit feed these cows, um, just the amount of energy that, that they're needing to meet their requirements. Um, we've successfully wintered cows using high concentrate trait feeds that at a real low rate, just looking for maintenance. Uh, there are some feedlots in the Texas Panhandle and, and in Southwest Kansas that are gone completely to raising beef cows in confinement on, on feed. Um, you know, the, the, they're using that as a source of calves for their other finishing yards, um, but it's very management intensive. Feed management is critical. We need to have on-time delivery of a consistent feed supply for this. And, and just common sense animal husbandry goes a long way, getting it fed at the same time, feeding the correct amount, mixing or feed right. All of those things are, are essential to this, but you can save up to half the cost of feeding hay in a supplement because we're cutting back on the feed we're supplying uh, tremendously. Um, rough guidelines from a OSU fact sheet. This is fairly uh, old one that Dr. Gill had put together and it's still good information. You know, if they're mixing, uh, you know, corn for a gestating cow, you only need about three quarter percent of body weight about a two pound per day of a protein supplement and roughage at about a half percent of body weight. Um, as you know, we move up into lactation or have cows at peak milk when we're, we're doing this, you know, average milk, we're looking at about 1% of body weight of corn. Uh, high milk, we're looking at about 1.1. Protein needs go up for those lactating cows. So it's gonna be a little bit costlier. Plus, we're going to have to watch out for those calves and their consuming of the feed too. Um, we did a study where we were looking at feeding hay in a supplement versus uh, four different uh, total mixed diets to cows just to meet their requirement. We had a corn-based uh, feed with cottonseed holes or a corn-based feed with rice holes and then a corn gluten-based feed with cottonseed holes and, and rice holes. Um, we kept the protein about the same using cottonseed meal and urea for these corn-based diets um, and supplied a complete mineral pack in all these. Um, one thing to note, our body weight change was more for those cattle fed hay and supplement. We actually lost, gained very little body weight or lost some body weight when we're feeding maintenance uh, rates to these cows. But most of that body weight change, if we look at our body condition scores, we're actually seeing a bigger increase in body condition scores on a lot of these limit fed diets. So gut fill is going to be a big impact on that uh, uh, because we're feeding so much less, the passage rate's gonna be so much higher. Um, we have about a third to half of the amount of feed going into those cows. And this was a time when hay was extremely expensive uh, because of the drought and people were having to ship it in from Iowa and Nebraska. So uh, very high savings in, in feed cost down to a less than half the, the price per day. So what do we expect? These cows are hungry. They're gonna have aggressive behavior at the feed bunk they're going to be ready and waiting for you. They're gonna consume your ration in as little as 20 to 30 minutes. So they're gonna have a lot of free time to mess with stuff. Uh, you better have good fences, um, probably a hot wire standing off from your, your uh, barbed wire fence, and they're gonna tear up stuff. They're gonna rub on things and, and chew on things. They're gonna paste the fences and crib on or chew on, on any wood fences they can find. It takes about two weeks to get them to adapt to the diet. Increased roughage may help with this, uh, along with the safety of that feed. Um, the variation in weight gains versus losses, you know, it's, it's gut fill, hay to concentrate ratio. You've got to have good control of bunk space, plenty of bunk space for all the cows to get around it. And the calves need to be, con you know, considered in, in your feed delivery, if you're going to keep the calves on there, you could raise the feed bunks for those cows. 
so that the calves would have restricted access and provide some creep access to some, some other feed for the calves. This is a, another trial we did, which is a corn stock based diet on some, uh, we were feeding to some replacement heifers. Um, this was a really good system for these replacement heifers compared to feeding hay in a supplement. Um, we could deliver to them the, the exact amount of nutrients they needed. We could keep condition on those cows, young cows, you know, at an acceptable level. And we actually had better breed ups on the cows that we had on this limit fed uh, total mix diet than we had on the cows fed hay and supplement. Even though we were designing our supplement delivery, you know, those, you know, young cows trying to still be growing, you know, is really hard on them to, to keep up on, on hay intake and all that. So with that, you know, uh, going through this really fast, you know, if you have any questions or, or, or need some help, you know, just contact your county agent, myself or our area livestock specialists, we can work you up on some of these. Um, we need to, you know, start with a low level of grain and then increase it slowly. And then, you know, that gets you to where you can, can get that room and adapted. And like I said before, just good management is essential with the accurate feeding and accurate delivery. Um, things to conclude, you know, things could be worse. If you have a plan, you can, you know, make that plan fit in. And um, it, we need to think about these things ahead, you know, and, if we make our ranch drought proof, some of these changes could be economical and, and even profitable to the production system. So with that, I appreciate the uh, invitation to speak and hopefully I didn't run too long. That's great, Dr. Beck. Uh, we do got one question. How would the formulation of these limit fed rations differ from a conventional formulation of high producing dairy cows? It would be really, could be very similar to that because with, with those high producing dairy cows, we're really wanting to, you know, get adequate fiber into them. It's a fairly safe diet. Uh, the, the diets we were, are using would, would probably be a little bit higher in, in roughage and fiber than what you'd see with a high producing dairy cow. And we're using a lot lower quality roughage than what you would expect with a dairy ration. And would you uh, handle some of these supplements different, thinking about maybe a short-term drought, you know, we're always, a, what they say, a week away from a drought versus, you know, when we get into spans of a few months, uh, would you manage those different, getting those different supplements or just increase what you're already doing? I, I think, you know, if we're just looking at a short-term drought, you know, just doing those things you would need to do if you're running short on hay, but still have hay, you know, start managing your hay feeding tighter, you know, yeah. decrease the, the hay waste and, you know, just feed what the, the cattle will actually consume in a day, you know, do those, you know, steps in managing hay feeding so that we really limit the amount of waste we're looking at. Well, I guess we'll have probably room at the end if we do have any more questions, Dr. Beck, but I guess we'll move along with the program. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Or Brian Pugh, our Northeast Area Agronomist uh, for OSU. He's going to be talking about uh, late winter management of cool season forages. So, Brian, if you can go ahead and share your screen. Looks like you got it. Okay, hopefully you can hear me here. Yep, good to go. All right. Well, like Josh said, I'm going to talk a little bit about managing some of your cool season forages as we get to this point in the year, specifically looking at late winter. Uh, very glad to hear some of the stuff Dr. Beck talked about in his preliminary slides. That's a lot of the things we try to talk to producers about is just conserving some of that waste and, and pre-planning 
and we'll we'll spend a little bit of time on that as we get to the end of my presentation. Uh, but again, I kind of looked at this as as what are some of those common questions that we tend to get uh, when we get into droughty conditions, and what are those talking points that we really try to focus on to to help a producer with. So again, nothing really in depth here. Just going to hit some high points. Uh, going to focus mainly on uh, cool season small grain forages today, but for those of you that are in eastern Oklahoma and rely on fescue or annual ryegrass, a lot of these talking points will be the same uh, for those species as well. Just want to start off showing, you know, our basic growth distribution of these cool season forages are fairly similar across most species. Again, uh, if we're looking at annuals, we typically recommend planting those in the fall time period, somewhere over here in this September time frame. Uh, if we're dealing with a perennial such as fescue, of course, that's when it starts to actively grow again in the fall. And we expect about one third of our total production to occur in the fall. And then we would expect that following spring, about two thirds of our production to occur there. So the blue bar is just simply where we're setting in relation to the year today. And as you can see, we're right on the precipice of seeing this exponential spring growth that we typically get with our cool season forages. And, and that's a good thing. If we've got cool season forages out there ready to go, uh, basically that tells us we need to get ready to manage those. And that's what we're gonna start talking about. I will mention here, uh, there are some differences between species and varieties within species. Uh, so for instance, if you're a big fan of cereal rye, you might see that potentially half of your annual production could be found in the fall and the remaining half in the spring. So there are some differences there. And, and that's a good thing uh, from my viewpoint as a forage manager, because I can really tailor my forage productivity month by month to match my cow herds requirements. So again, I've got just a real quick rainfall graph here from Okmulgee County, and that's fairly centralized for my area of Eastern Oklahoma. Uh, but I don't want you to get too hung up on the county because I want you to understand that most every county in the state of Oklahoma follows the same pattern. Uh, and we call that a bimodal rainfall pattern. So we tend to see peaks in April and May. We also see peaks in, in September and, and October a lot of years. And again, it's important to understand those are the times when we can really capitalize on getting fertilizer nutrients into a plant and converting those nutrients into forage production. And that's really the name of the game. And that's where cool season grasses, to me, really play a very important role in a grazing system. Because if we go back over 100 years of data, which you can find on the Mesonet website, and we look at even our very droughty years, such as 05 and 06, 11 and 12, what we find is that September is actually a pretty good month of the year to get rains. It's a pretty secure time of the year. And that time of year that we typically want to grow those warm season forages, whether it be Bermuda grass or old world blue stem, or maybe even some of the annuals we could plant, those are actually some of the riskiest months of the year for good rainfall. So again, a cool season forage really fits into a forage system uh, because it gets us away from some of that drought risk. Some of the rules of thumb that I'll hit on for fertility, uh, we've long said that a, one acre of forage will produce about one ton of production uh, if you're not fertilizing on our introduced forages. So again, fertility is really the name of the game when it comes to these introduced grasses. And for cool season grasses, such as wheat or fescue or annual ryegrass, it does take about 60 pounds of actual in, 130 pounds urea to make one additional ton of forage production. Now I would recommend if you're running some cool season forages, uh, small grain type forages, we've got the technology out there now to be much more precise as far as our nutrient management goes. We can run enriched strips in those fields uh, and use a handheld green seeker to tell us essentially how much nitrogen needs to be applied. If that's something that interests you, uh, that, is, that is a topic that any of our county extension educators can sure help you with. So get with them if you're interested in uh, possibly saving some nitrogen dollars in the long run. 
again, when we get to this point in the year, we're typically aiming for about a mid-February application of nitrogen on these cool season forages. Uh, so we're coming up on that pretty quick here. And we should expect about two to four tons, <coughs> excuse me, of spring yield based on variety and species. And again, because as I said earlier, it takes about 60 pounds in to make one additional ton. If we want to make three additional tons in the spring and we think we're gonna get the moisture to support that yield, it would require about 180 pounds of nitrogen, uh, both from the soil and from applied nitrogen sources. So keep that in mind. We can stair step that or stack those applications on top of each other and shoot for more yield. So here's a real common question. What if your cool season pasture will be limited? What if you don't think you'll have enough, let's say small grain pasture to just turn the cows out on it free choice and make it all the way until when our warm season grass starts to grow? And I'll be honest, that's a very common situation to be in. So what can we do? One of the first things that I'd recommend to do is figure out some way to manage the grazing of that cow herd on those forages. And strip grazing is a great way to do that. Uh, Dr. Lawman's done some excellent work on utilizing limit grazing of small grain pasture for cow herd. And again, a lot of good data there that you can go look at. This is some work that stems directly from his recommendations. Uh, and I'll show you some data on that here in just a minute. But as you can see here, we're limiting cows with a single hot wire and we were able to achieve about 83% harvest efficiency. Now to put that in terms of what we accomplished there, if we were just turning cows out and giving them free choice access on that, there'd be a lot of trampling waste, uh, a lot of waste from forage getting mature ahead of the cows and we'd probably be less than 50% harvest efficiency. So again, that just stretches the pounds of forage that you have into more grazing days and that's gonna save you money in the long term as far as hay and supplementation. What we did here at Perkins Research Station, we used a timed limit grazing event, two hours every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We would had an automatic gate opener, let the cows in. We would go back out and push the cows out. And if we look at the data here, what we see is that even though we had very small acreage, less than a quarter acre per cow, nine acres for 42 cows. We did get quite a few grazing days out of that. Total cow days per acre, we got almost 120 cow grazing days per acre. Our cost per cow per day was 68 cents. Uh, if we think about a lot of our supplements are gonna cost us 45 to 75 cents per cow per day. And if you're feeding $30 a bale hay to a cow free choice, that's gonna cost us a dollar or a little better per cow per day. So that looks really good when we look at cost. Again, good harvest efficiency, and we did see a weight change of the, on those cows. We increased about 16 pounds over the period we were on that forage. Essentially what this let us do is from January 15th to about March 15th, we totally eliminated our supplement that we needed for those cows. We fed them just an average quality hay and let them limit graze. And then again, uh, the remainder of the spring, once that forage started regrowing, we let those cows just have free choice access to it. So a lot of good quality. Uh, if you look up top, 21% protein, 73 TDN, that's almost as good as a 20% in a bag. So again, keep that in mind, limit grazing can really get us a long ways on some of these uh, cool season forages. Just an overhead picture kind of shows you the differences in grazing following some of those regrowth periods. Another question I got a lot when we looked at the 11 and 12 drought was what if you don't have any cool season pasture? What if I'm specifically Bermuda or Old World Blue Stem and I just ran out of hay in the middle of January, what can I do? Well, I think Dr. Beck addressed some of the things we could do from a supplement standpoint. One of the questions I got a whole lot back uh, after that last bad drought was what could we plant in the spring that would help us kind of bridge that gap and get back to warm season growth? And some of the real common things that I heard is, you know, can we spring seed ryegrass? Can we spring seed small grains? And we wanted to specifically look at that. 
I will tell you, we had a trial at Haskell at Eastern Research Station where we kind of looked at using a no-till drill. We drilled in different varieties of small grains, such as wheat and oats. We also looked at putting ryegrass uh, in on those trials. But we assumed that the producer's budget was busted at that point because they'd already spent it on hay and supplement early in the year. And we said, well, what would happen if we seeded these, but we didn't fertilize, we didn't suppress any of the cool season broadleaf weeds that were there. And just a real quick, quick summary, I will tell you that we saw pretty much stand failures across the board, regardless of what species we used. So if you're wanting to go in in the spring and sod seed with a no-till drill, but you're not willing to suppress some of those broadleaf annual and grassy annual weeds that are already in that stand, and you're not willing to fertilize, you can probably expect stand failure is going to be your result. So with that in mind, we looked at another study here. This was on a producer property in Nowata County. We looked at March 14th seeding. We used the mesonet tool for three-day average soil temperatures, temperatures to uh, pinpoint when we were between 40 and 45 degree soil temps. That's perfect planting time for oats. And, and we were late that year. Most years we should see those soil temperatures by mid-February. We went into a clean till seed bed and we drill seeded 20 pounds of annual ryegrass or 60 pounds of wheat, 60 pounds of okay oats or two different rates of these dry feed oats that so many producers want to plant. Now I will tell you real quick, we don't recommend those dry feed oats because there's no guarantee behind them. It's also possible that they are a protected variety that could get you into trouble for planting them. And there's also no guarantee as to how much weed seeds could be present. So you could pick up a lot of weeds from those dry oats as well. But again, it was a common practice and we wanted to look at it. We also fertilized these plots with either zero or 50 pounds of nitrogen as urea, and then we harvested samples later in the year. Now again, we planted on March 14th, we harvested on May 10th, and what you can see here is that really oats were the option that made the most sense, and when we put an economic spin on it, they were the only species that actually gave us a positive economic return both ryegrass and wheat fell below our establishment cost in returning any money to the system. Uh, Dr. Jeff Edwards has long pointed out that if we don't get enough cold weather in the spring, which is called vernalization, wheat will barely produce any yield when seeded in the spring. So this, this year we did get some cold temperatures and the wheat looked okay, but I will tell you on an average year, expect spring seeded oats to make about four to five times what spring seeded wheat will. One other thing I wanna point out with this study here is that the majority of the growth you see on these bars on this chart occurred after the last week of April. And that's important to me because the reason we were spring seeding in the first place was to replace forage for the cow herd. We did not find that that was the case. What we see is that the contribution to reducing those winter feeding costs in the current year with spring seeding just didn't happen. Now it would be a great option to kind of reclaim some lost hay to replenish your hay stocks for a future year, but don't expect it to get you out of a bind that you're in right now. It reminds me of that saying, it's too little too late. And that's what we see with these spring seeded forages. Great for a hay crop, but it's not gonna get you out of winter feeding of hay and supplement. And that kind of brings me to my last point here, proper planning. And we've got lots of data on fall seeding of these cool season forages. And if any of y'all tuned in a few months ago to the, to the small grain forage management session on here, you got a lot of that information but I just want to quickly point this out. This was on the same producer property in 2013. Uh, the portion of the field that we did not use for the spring seeding trial, the producer actually went in the fall before and planted uh, a mixture of 100 pounds of wheat and 20 pounds of annual ryegrass. Half of it was conventionally tilled, half, half of it was sod seeded, and it was managed to OSU spec. So it was fertilized up front with 46 pounds of actual in uh, pre-plant. 
On March 14th, the lower left-hand graph, what you're seeing there, we made over 2,000 pounds of production on the sod seeded area, over 4,000 pounds of production on the clean tilled area. And now remember, that's the exact same day that we got warm enough soil temperatures to plant our spring seeded forages. So while our spring seeded forages were making zero yield, we already had over two tons of yield from the clean tilled fall seeded stand. And if we look at the lower right graph, what you see there is we were anywhere from about six and a half to close to nine tons of full production, which would be considered a potential hay yield. So again, it's pretty easy to see that, that prior planning, getting those forages in in the fall and managing them properly up front is definitely going to be the best way to hedge against drought conditions. And again, this was what most people were saying was one of the driest periods on record, yet this producer capitalized on that knowledge that September rains are fairly consistent and he used those rains to convert nutrients and moisture into forage production. The last thing I'll leave you with here, this is a result of a lot of different trials over time in Oklahoma looking at the result of planting date as far as fall forage yield goes. And what you see here is that the longer we wait past the 1st of September, this green line, which is forage yield, continues to decrease for fall yield. Now, the reason that's important is because that fall yield is essentially an illustration of how well we were able to develop a secondary root system and get that plant to the point where it could start tillering and producing additional plants. So the take home here is that every day germination is delayed past September 1, you're gonna get about 50 pounds per acre of less forage by winter time. So that prior planting is gonna be really important. To summarize what I've talked about here, prior forage planting will ease those drought effects. OSU trials have shown the benefit of early seeding for fall forage production time and time again. Fall seeding will beat spring seeding in Oklahoma, hands down, and follow fertility recommendations for optimal yields and economic returns. All right, so again, just try to hit a few high points, common questions that I typically get. So if there's any questions, I'll try to answer them. Great job, Brian. Uh, we do got one question. Uh, what is your thoughts on planting a mix of small grains, wheat, rye, winter barley, winter oats? What's also your thoughts on maybe including a legume, clovers or vetch? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, I actually like seeding mixes. If we're not in an area where we're going to be going back to a grain only or a dual purpose crop, I like seeding mixes. Now, if there's a chance that you're going to want to try to grow wheat on that next year, I wouldn't be mixing in cereal rye and I sure wouldn't be mixing in annual ryegrass because of the weed potential. But in long term studies and in studies we've done at Haskell as well, we do see that adding ryegrass into the mix tends to boost those spring yields more than any single species alone. And as I mentioned earlier, we can mix something such as cereal rye and wheat. Uh, those are a fairly complementary uh, mix because cereal rye produces more forage in the fall, tends to mature quicker in the spring where wheat is later maturing in the spring. So again, I do like the mixes there. And for legumes, I would say yes. One of the biggest issues is, is getting those legumes to actually have a large enough presence uh, to make a difference in quality. So most of the time I hear mixes with brassicas and legumes and things like that. And, and again, that's not a bad thing to have. It's just a lot of times we see in fall seeded stands, the cereal grains will kind of crowd those out somewhat, if that makes sense. Excellent. And <coughs> we got another question about fall seeding, uh, specifically for southeastern Oklahoma. So fall, fall sod seeding. Fall sod seeding. Okay, real quick rundown. If you are going to sod seed, uh, into Bermuda grass thatch and you expect it to be economically viable, you do need to suppress that Bermuda grass sod. Time and time again, we see that if even if you graze it super short, the Bermuda grass can pop back up quick enough that it robs most of the moisture and nutrients from that emerging small grain stand. 
So you're going to get good spring production out of that stand, but you can't expect much fall production unless you're willing to suppress the Bermuda. I hope that addresses that question. If not, you can email me or get, get to me at a later date and I'll try to expand on that. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I do have one comment I always get questions about. I know you began showing that rainfall uh, patterns throughout the year and we kind of get those two spikes and you also pointed out that that summertime is going to be that most risk for drought uh, but what's often overlooked why we rely on small grains especially in western Oklahoma is that we're not losing that soil moisture throughout the winter like we do in the summer so that half inch rain goes a lot further on a cool season crop than maybe a, a warm season crop would would you agree I would agree yeah that's a great point and I've heard producers say that in February that have strictly Bermuda stands. They say, I hope this moisture sticks around until Bermuda starts growing in May. And that's a great point, Josh. If you had that cool season forage there, you wouldn't have to be worried about that. It would be converting that into forage production immediately. Yeah. So evapotranspiration is a lot less in the winter. They will utilize more instead of losing it. Well, I guess we'll move along, uh, try to get back on track. Uh, we got Leland McDaniel to uh, end the series. Uh, normally talking about jump starting warm season forages. Uh, <coughs> Leland's our South Central Extension Forage Specialist and Ag Educator in Cleveland or Carter and Jefferson County. Uh, so Leland, looks like you already got your slides going. Hand it off to you. Can't hear you, Leland. Can you hear me? There you go. You're good okay. to go. Slides good. Looks great. Okay. Well, my role today was uh, simply to talk about uh, in the face of drought, uh, what can we do to maybe jumpstart some of our warm season forages. Uh, and our presenters earlier today, Dr. Beck talked about some cattle management. Uh, Brian talked about some cool season uh, forage management. And so I'm gonna address the, the warm season component a little bit. When we started planning this program back in October, November, uh, we thought uh, based on predictions that maybe things would look a little bit worse at the moment than what they currently do. Uh, although there's portions of the state that are, are uh, uh, getting in reasonably severe drought, but uh, nonetheless, uh, and I'm having a little bit of trouble advancing my slide. There we go. We know that a drought's going to occur sooner or later, and, and I'm sure everyone on here has probably seen one form or another of this graph, and I apologize that it's not updated past 2012. I tried to get on uh, Oklahoma Climatological Survey and, and get a newer uh, uh, image, but uh, couldn't get on there yesterday, couldn't access their files, so we'll use this uh, anyway, but uh, going back to 1895, uh, if we look at rainfall patterns in Oklahoma, we can see that it tends to be cyclical, 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 I'm sorry, much like the stock market and generally speaking tends to go in about seven to 10 year swings from wetter than normal to drier than normal uh, until and most people are familiar with the Dust Bowl of the 30s. Some of you on here may be old enough to remember the drought of the 50s, which was actually uh, more severe than the Dust Bowl. It just is, wasn't as long in terms of duration. And then most everyone on here, I'm sure, is aware that, that in the last 30 years, uh, from the 80s to the early 2000s, we had a 30 year wetter than normal cycle. This was the anomaly of this whole chart. And the significance of this is, I think, is that under this heavy rainfall and consistent rainfall over this long a duration, it changed the landscape in terms of, of uh, flora and the general biomass. And so when we grow more 
biomass, we require more water. And so then when, when we don't get these rains, the impact is, is more severe than uh, maybe it would have been under a more uh, moderate rainfall scenario. So we, we've changed things. We, we increased stocking rates, I have no doubt, over that 30 year period. We also know from some of Dr. Dave Lawman's work and others, we increased mature cow size. So we significantly increased the uh, demand on the forage resource. Uh, everyone uh, in their short-term memory remembers the 10, 11, and 12 drought. Uh, and uh, so where are we at today in Oklahoma? This was a snapshot of uh, a recent uh, drought monitor map. And while most of the state looks reasonably well, we do see some, some uh, troubling areas in the Panhandle, Western, Southwestern Oklahoma, and in South Central Oklahoma, uh, even uh, some areas that, that uh, could teeter one way or the other pretty quickly. The old saying goes that we're never more than two weeks from a drought. Uh, and I think uh, that, that tends to be very true. So what I'm gonna talk about today uh, the first thing that I'm going to talk about, and, and uh, maybe one of the benefits of, of Zoom is that I won't hear the collective gasp of most of those in attendance when I start talking about fertilizing in the face of a drought. And as risky as that may seem on the outset, contrary to conventional wisdom, I think fertility is, uh, we ought to look at it as drought insurance. Uh, this is a picture of Brian Pugh, or just our previous speaker. This is at uh, Haskell Research Station. And if I'm not mistaken, this was in 2010 or 12 at the tail end of that drought. And in some plots, and you see that Brian's got his hands over some different treatments showing you the height of those treatments. If you can see the delineation between these flags on the plots, you see definite differences in forage height, uh, forage color, and forage density. And we're going to come back to that in just a little bit. But why, Leland, would you talk about fertilizing in the face of a drought, spending fertilizer dollars when we don't know if it's going to rain? It's not a new concept. In fact, there's some old work, Texas A&M, uh, almost as old as I am, that some research work said that it requires about 20 inches of rainfall to produce one ton of forage per acre on unfertilized Bermuda. However, under good fertility, appropriate fertility, it only requires about four inches of rainfall to produce that same ton of forage. So what that's telling us is, is that fertilizer makes the forage about four to five times more efficient at utilizing whatever limited rainfall that we get. And as you see here on the chart, uh, uh, total dry matter and crude protein or forage quality continue to increase as we increase uh, fertility rates uh, of, of nitrogen, while at the, at the same time it decreases the amount of water or inches per ton of forage produced. So again, I'll reemphasize, fertilizer makes our introduced forages much more efficient at utilizing limited rainfall. This concept would also hold true for other introduced forages such as the old world blue stems like meat all uh, and others. Some more recent work, again, this was from Brian at uh, Eastern Research Station in Haskell. In 2012, still on the tail end of the last severe drought that we experienced. And in those plots that you saw him in that picture, we see that without fertility, no nitrogen, the check plots averaged about a, a little over a ton per acre uh, at about 3.4 inches of rainfall to produce that ton. As we increase nitrogen rates, we see not only do we increase the, the tonnage uh, of, of dry matter on a per acre basis, but it reduced the amount of water in ratio to that towards produced. Now all these plots receive the same amount of rain. They're in the same uh, research plot, but fertilizer again, made that forage much more efficient 
at producing uh, dry matter uh, in relation to the amount of rainfall that it received. So the next few slides I'm going to show are pretty, pretty elemental, but I, I think it this is the educator coming out in me and in my 30 years of working with producers. I, I think sometimes we we overlook some of the simplistic things. And this is just a reminder that plants, forages, just like people, humans, just like cattle, have complex nutrient requirements. It's not just about nitrogen. Uh, producers, I think, too often uh, get in the habit of, and worry too much about how much nitrogen they put out uh, without giving adequate uh, concern for phosphorus, potassium, and uh, soil pH. And so oftentimes they'll come in to me and complain that, well, I put nitrogen out, but I just didn't see the response that I, that I should have. Well, usually there's underlying reasons for that. The best analogy that I've ever seen, again, this is pretty elemental, but I think it's just it's so valuable, and I don't know who to cite for this, but it's an automobile. And so if we assume that, that nitrogen is like the fuel we put in the fuel tank, phosphorus is like the oil in the crankcase, we use more nitrogen, more fuel, we have to replenish it more frequently. Uh, phosphorus, we use much less of it. We check it two or three times a year. And the coolant in the radiators like potassium. And again, we use even less of that. But the analogy is, is that this nitrogen, like gas, determines how much how, uh, we grow, how far we go. But if we don't have enough phosphorus in the, in the crankcase or coolant in the radiator, that engine's gonna, that system's gonna lock up and freeze up before we can burn that entire tank of nitrogen. So nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium must be provided in balance if you're gonna see the benefit. Again, it's not a new concept. Justice von Liebig, a German scientist in 1873, published his, what he called the law of the minimum, which simply states that if any nutrient is deficient, then forage yield is going to be limited to the level of that limiting nutrient. So simply, if we're low, simply put, if we're low in phosphorus or, and or potassium, just adding more nitrogen is going to limit our yields. They will always be limited. We may increase yields by adding more nitrogen, but we're going to waste a significant portion of that nitrogen. If phosphorus is 50% deficient in your soils, then regardless of how much nitrogen you put out there, whether it's 50 pounds or 400 pounds, means that you're going to waste about 50% of that nitrogen because the plants cannot utilize it. To add another layer to that is pH, and many of you have probably seen this chart, but just simply showing that if pH is too acidic or too alkaline, then nutrients get bound up in other compounds and they're unavailable to the plant. So in, in addition to ensuring that we supply adequate amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, to utilize them, we've got to ensure that we've got adequate pH. And I equate that to like tire pressure. We can address nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and we can ensure that they're available at appropriate levels. But if, if pH is off, we're still not going to do a good job of utilizing all that nitrogen that we put in. So my encouragement to you is and this is the time to be, be, be doing it, is pull soil samples. Consult with your local educator, county extension educator. Uh, just like an automobile, those gauges are there for a reason. That's what a soil test is, is simply a gauge. And it's not rocket science, but it is science and it is proven. Okay, back to the image that, that you saw of Brian kneeling in the field and these, these same plots, and again, this was back in 2012. This is a Bermuda grass stand, it had been drought stressed under no fertility. You can see an average height of about nine, a little over nine inches average height and an estimated dry matter uh, of about 1,290 pounds per acre. 
Now you can see in this canopy, we've got holes in the canopy, it's drought stress and mother nature doesn't like voids. So anytime sunlight's hitting bare soil, she's gonna fill it with something. And even though we've got 1290 pounds of, of uh, biomass here, a considerable portion of that is made up about two thirds of other warm season grasses and forbs. Uh, so uh, in stress stands, uh, uh, other species are gonna take advantage of a lack of competition from the Bermuda or the old world blue stem or whatever our forage base is uh, to establish. So this is after 57 days of growth under no fertility, those same plots, this is from a plot that was fertilized with a rate of 130 pounds of N, 120 pounds phosphorus, 133 pounds of potassium. And I think if I remember correctly, that was equivalent, this poultry litter equivalent of about two tons per acre. Uh, but under fertility, the important thing to remember, and this was with only three inches of rainfall over this 57 day, two month period, that we increased forage dry matter from 1,290 pounds to 3,700. So we tripled uh, dry matter uh, forage production, uh, double the average height. So this is what fertility can do even with limited rainfall. Another study when Brian was in uh, the county office with his predecessor, Chris Rice, and I threw this up they were looking at, at different sources of nitrogen and I get that question oftentimes and you can see from their study, they saw no significant differences whether they were using ammonium nitrate, urea or urea with agritank. But I think there's a couple of other messages in this slide that we, we need to take to heart. And one is this application was put out early season in May and we look at the total production if we waited until we put it out in June, we reduced total yields a little bit, maybe not greatly, uh, because generally speaking, June, I think is our first or second wettest month of the year. Uh, but we never know a drought, we have windows of opportunity. And if it remains dry to the fall, we know on our introduced forages, Bermuda grass and the old world blue stems, that a, a uh, August application just prior to, to fall rains, much like Brian talked about a moment ago with the cool seasons, we can produce some additional forage prior to a killing frost if we get it out there prior to the rainfall. And that's the key, I think, in this, this graphic. We must have the fertility down before it rains and not after it rains. And even in a drought, uh, we'll see windows of opportunity when we get some rainfall. Uh, so it's important. And I can tell you from trials that I've conducted down here over the years, Chris Rice and I did one uh, one time. I don't have the data for it here, but uh, I have had producers that will wait until July to fertilize. Well, again, we're already past our spring rains. But fortunately that year, we got some good midsummer and late summer rains. And what we found on the July treatments was we produced as much total forage as we did our May treatment that year because we got those rains in July and August. So if the opportunity doesn't come until later, uh, don't give up. Uh, we, we still have an opportunity to get some fertility out even late season if the prospects for rain uh, occur uh, then. To re-emphasize that point of a late season or, or a, uh, August application, this was a bee doll plot that I had in Stevens County. Uh, applied for Tilly on August 5th after this was bailed off, this field of, of uh, old world blue stem. Uh, we applied for Tilly at, at uh, 50, 75, and 100 pounds of actual N per acre. We applied phosphorus per soil test re, uh, uh, report at 40 pounds per acre across the, the uh, plot. Potassium and pH were adequate. There's a 40, this is 48 days growth. The control or check plots produced because of the rainfall. We had some timely rains after we put these treatments out. Even the control produced uh, about a, 
a ton and a half per acre with without that August application. But look what the fertilizer allowed the forage to do with that rainfall that we received. 50 pounds of N with adequate P uh, produce uh, an additional ton per acre response. 75 pounds, about two and a quarter tons of additional forage. Again, all forage growth is a product of nutrient availability and rainfall uh, primarily and management as well. But this is what fertilizer does is it, it allows that forage to make better use of, of rainfall, uh, no matter how limited or when it may come, as long as we have uh, some growing days left. So, what can we do with fertility on the introduced forages? Again, phosphorus is, is significant for root growth, which also has import for the, that forage's ability to uh, extract nutrients and moisture uh, from the soil profile at greater depths. So we want to apply nitrogen at green up or just prior to rainfall. We can split applications and apply additional in based on opportunities that occur during a drought uh, with periodic limited rainfall. And potassium uh, not only is significant uh, for nitrogen use efficiency, just like phosphorus, but it also plays a role in, in uh, uh, drought tolerance of forage species. If you need a, a uh, uh, you've got hay fields, need a quick uh, replenish some hay stocks, uh, you know, what can we do with some warm season annuals? In my part of the world, a lot of time we've got ryegrass uh, overseeded in Bermuda and guys trying to manage to, to maximize that ryegrass uh, hay crop. But just like Brian said, as we get uh, a lot of that will, work, will occur after April, but we get into May and June, early part of June, it's playing out. We've got Bermuda grass, it's underneath that canopy and struggling. Uh, what can we do? Uh, you know, we focus a lot of times on those cool season forages, but this graphic, I think, look at it in the inches per ton. It was talked about evapotranspiration rates a while ago are much lower during the growing season, these cool season forages. Uh, but once we get into warmer weather or late spring, early spring, late spring, some of our warm season species are much more water efficient in terms of producing dry matter uh, with limited rainfall. So uh, there's opportunity there. Uh, uh, some species are naturally more drought, drought tolerant uh, and uh, crabgrass, uh, I don't know how many of you have used crabgrass. Uh, certainly everybody sat on the lawnmower in late summer when it's got dry and uh, the Bermuda grass is browned out. The crabgrass uh, still, you've got to gear down, go a little bit slower. It wants to bog up a mower, but uh, it, it is a very high moisture uh, forage that, that uh, uh, does an excellent job in dry weather. Uh, and TEF is a more recent species that Brian's done some excellent work with, was introduced here from Ethiopia, so it's very drought tolerant. Uh, and if we can get it established ahead of some, some uh, limited rainfall with good fertility, uh, we can replenish some hay stocks. Native grass, I just had a call this morning, a producer wanting to plant bee doll, which is well, one of the species of old world blue stems. And in my 30 years, uh, it's never ceased to amaze me. We chase some miracle grasses and I, I, I dislike to take the opportunity to state there is no miracle grass and it's all about management. And mother nature over thousands, if not millions of years, uh, selected species that were capable of, of tolerating and thriving in our Oklahoma conditions of that, go back to that uh, cycle from 1895 or that, that uh, graph rainfall chart and the wet and dry cycles that we have. They're deep rooted, they can extract moisture from, from greater depths. Uh, We've just got to do a, a, a learn to try to manage them. But look at the root system on this this uh, switchgrass stand, and 
I think it's easier to understand in period of drought, they can extract moisture from much greater depths than some of our introduced species. So mother nature's no fool and she gave us a wonderful resource to work with, uh, but we, we've just got to learn to, to manage, it, manage it. This again is Eastern Research Station. This is a Bermuda grass stand on May the 18th in 2016 with almost a ton of, of uh, dry matter per acre. This is a stand of switchgrass. Again, this was clean till and then planted into clean till field and established stand of switchgrass on that same date with over 6,000 pounds of, of standing forage. So these native grasses, if managed appropriately, are, are wonderful resources. They won't tolerate the continuous uh, high stocking rates, uh, but if we learn to manage them, uh, they, they uh, can, can be very efficient. I get the question periodically, what about fertilizing native rain sites? That's a little dicier question and, and uh, uh, years of research by Oklahoma State University, Kansas State University, and many others. The, the common uh, uh, thought is, is that we know that native grasses will respond to fertility. Uh, but generally speaking, oftentimes they don't give an economic response. In other words, they won't produce enough additional forage to pay for the cost of the fertilizer. Can they be used as a stopgap, short-term uh, uh, practice to help you through a drought? Possibly. Uh, it may or may not pencil out in terms of, of profitability, but we can certainly increase forage production if you think a drought's going to be short in duration and, and just trying to get through one growing season. We can increase forage production uh, with fertilizer on native range. I think the significant thing to note here, and this was a, a, a multi-year study done uh, by Noble Research Institute, and I use it some because it is local for me, but we see that we can increase forage uh, dry matter production. Profitability becomes questionable but, questionable, but I want you to note that putting no fertilizer down in terms of profitability uh, was more profitable than putting 100 pounds of nitrogen only down. If you're going to fertilize native range, I think we, what this points out is we have to apply some phosphorus. If you look at the, the response in, uh, in terms of dry matter production and in terms of profitability, uh, if we're going to do anything, we have to include phosphorus in that. Whether or not it's going to be profitable, it's going to depend on uh, cattle market and fertilizer prices. Uh, and you're the only one that can determine that. And, and it may require that you sharpen a pencil and do a little math. If you've got native hay grass uh, uh, meadows, uh, native grass hay meadows, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I think we, we do need to think about replenishing some phosphorus. Under a grazing scenario, uh, phosphorus is largely recycled. So on, on the native rangelands that we graze, with that, those phosphorus levels really don't change much over time. But in a hay meadow, anytime we haul a leaf crop off that site, we're mining a lot of phosphorus and potassium off with it. So over time, we see a degradation of those native range sites uh, because we've re we're removing a lot of phosphorus and potassium. So I think we need to think about replenishing those. And anytime, if and uh, you should decide that, that uh, maybe that's a short-term strategy to help you uh, through a drought, if you're going to fertilize native range, you're certainly going to see a response to that fertility from the weeds and forbs that are out there. So I think it's imperative if you're going to do that, you uh, either need really good range condition in terms of, of uh, species composition and or you need a weed control program in conjunction with that uh, to maximize uh, that effort. Hey Leland, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're about 10 minutes already over. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just quickly, I talk about grazing management height. Again, don't overstock. There's an old saying, it takes money to make money. 
I like to tell my producers, it takes grass to grow grass. Those leaves are the solar panel for those plants that collect sunlight, conduct photosynthesis, manufacture carbohydrate, store up as energy reserves in the root system. Uh, so we've got to leave some leaf surface out there. Uh, so how do we manipulate dry matter yields, and mitigate the impacts of, of uh, drought? We can do it with fertility, especially on the introduced forages and through grazing harvest and management and leaving some uh, uh, appropriate uh, residue height uh, out there. That's it. Great job, Leland. Uh, we do got a couple questions. Uh, we got one about what does the timing need to be for nitrogen and phosphorus application on a native range? Uh, again, it's going to be just like for me. it needs to be prior to rainfall. Uh, we've got a, a depending on part of the state, uh, 240 to 60 day growing season. Uh, we know on the introduced species, again, we can produce an additional ton of forage from August 1, mid August to a killing freeze if the fertility is there. So I'm going to assume that if rainfall is limited in spring and early summer, uh, if we needed, thought we, we could justify fertilizing native grass, then I'd certainly think that we could fertilize it as late as April. Well, the key is getting it down before rainfall. And again, whether we're, we're talking about native grass or introduced forages, if we get the fertilizer out and it doesn't rain, that's a bank. We're banking that fertility for when it does rain. It, it's going to be there uh, largely uh, until we do get a rain. So look at it as a savings account. It's insurance against uh, uh, the impact of drought and, and allowing you to produce some forage with, with whatever limited rainfall we'll get whenever it does come. So prior to rainfall, got to move it into the root system. Thanks, Leland. David, we got time for one more question or? Uh, one more question, Leland. Uh, has the yield and fertilizer efficiency on native grasses ever been compared across soil types with high or low yield potentials? I don't know the answer to that. I know there's some other states that have done some work uh, that would suggest a, a and some are saying a little bit different than what some of the Oklahoma State and Kansas State research has shown. Uh, and, and those are certainly different soil types. I can't speak to what they are specifically. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I don't know of any uh, locally Oklahoma State uh, research that would look at different soil types, uh, specifically in terms of response to fertility. Thanks again. Sorry we went over a little bit, but I guess I'll hand it back to Dr. Beck or Lawman. Thank you very much for attending this session of the uh, Rangers Thursday lunchtime series. We got had really good retention of, of all of our uh, or a lot of our uh, attendees. So it was an excellent set of talks. I really appreciate your work, Josh, and, and the other speakers. Yeah, good turnout today, and uh, occasionally we do go over a little. That's a lot of really good information in a short period of time and not much time for those speakers, <clears throat> but folks can leave when they want to. We understand they've got other things to do, and, and these recordings are available, and of course, you can, you can slide through those and 